Hey everybody, it's Ron Johnson and this is Locked On Sports Minnesota and it's Friday. So you know what that means? Yep, it's Friday. It's Saturday, Sunday. What? Well, come on now, you kids bop people. You know what the song is. Kids bop. You know it. But I'm Ron Johnson. We got Sam Ekstrom, Reggie Wilson, Julie Jones. This is Locked On Sports Minnesota and it's our Friday roundtable. The whole cast is here. So much going on in the sports world. The all-star game for football. Eh. I don't know what you guys thought about it. We might talk about that quickly, but there's a lot of other things in sports going on. So no further ado, Sam, what you got for us? Yeah, calendar turns to February. We are getting deeper into Vikings off-season mode. So we're going to rank our three Vikings off-season priorities, not including Kirk Cousins. And we got Wolves in the all-star game. But one of us thinks that there were possibly two snubs there. And how do we grade this Jorge Polanco trade? We'll tell you all about it. And TJ Hawkinson, we saw a lot of tight ends this year get hurt by the way of the Detroit Lions. Uh, TJ Hawkinson did have his ACL surgery. Also, Brian Flores is back for the Minnesota Vikings. So we'll talk about all that and much more. But I want everybody to know today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join the day and you'll get $200. That's $200. $100 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com backslash locked on to get started. And, hey, with basketball, there's some easy $5 bets to make, people. Trust me. The Timberwolves are on a tear. The Nuggets are doing well. The Clippers. And there's some absolutely tr- – by the way, just bet against the, the, the Pistons. You'll win. Just bet against the Pistons. Most likely it might not happen right away, but you'll win because the Pistons are trash. But now – Let's jump up to the first topic. Sam, take it away. Yeah, let's do it. Vikings off-season priorities. Uh, I think that the Kirk Cousins situation, the quarterback situation, it clouds everything because everything trickles down from that. But let's put that to the side just for a moment and talk about the other priorities on this team because you have to address, I think, a lot on defense, and you've got one onerous contract just hanging over everything with Justin Jefferson. So these are my three off-season priorities for the Vikings. I'm curious to hear your guys, but I think that number one, you need to decide what you're doing with Justin Jefferson. Now that decision could be sign him to the biggest wide receiver contract of all time, five years, 175 million, six years, 200 million, whatever it might be, or you got to have decisiveness about this. If if this is going to go south with Jefferson, if you can't sign him, you need to trade him for a million picks. But you need to make a decision which direction you're going. So don't make this linger. Don't get into franchise tag talk with him. Don't draw it out. Sign him or deal him and get a bounty in exchange. That's got to be priority number one is to take care of that situation. Number two, I want a free agent cornerback in here. I, I I need two cornerbacks. Byron Murphy's one. I need one more who can hold up in man coverage when you send six on the blitz. Um, last year, they were dropping back into zones. Teams kind of figured them out where the soft spots were. I need guys that can hold up in man for three seconds, and I need one of on each side. Murphy on one, someone else on the other. A free agent cornerback, and I want to draft a uh, pass rusher Vikings haven't drafted a high pass rusher in like a decade, like Daniel Hunter in the third round. And that's it in the last 10 years. Um, They need to get a pipeline going of edge rushing talent. I want an early defensive end or uh, outside linebacker in the draft. Those are my three Reggie. What do you think? So I'm with you on the Justin Jefferson thing, but I think with us, excluding the quarterback situation i think it's hard for me to say one way or another like because i feel like one kind of depends on the other mm-hmm. you know like I, I i don't know that they sign justin jefferson without a clear plan on what they're doing at quarterback i don't know that he wants to sign a deal without knowing what what um they're doing at quarterback so i'll leave that one alone um i think my top Offseason priority as far as plan goes, they got to get some corners in there that they, that can cover man to man. I think 
if you look back at Brian Flores, the height of his defense, I feel like was the Super Bowl against the Rams when he was the defensive or de facto defensive coordinator for the Patriots. They absolutely tortured those guys. What was the final score of that game? 13 to three. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, Stephon Gilmore was defensive player of the year that year. Like they locked those dudes, Brandon Cooks, that dynamic Rams offense, they locked those dudes down. I don't believe that his defense is suited to play zone like they were playing zone last year. And they were just getting chopped up because they didn't have the the weaponry to deploy the man coverage that I think we're used to seeing from Brian Flores' defense. So they have to get better at cornerback. I don't I don't have a specific uh plan as far as like drafting or or signing like they just got to get some cornerback help there the second part for me is pass rush I don't know what's going to happen with Daniil Hunter will he stay or will he go I know he wants to stay but I don't know if the money makes sense but they have to get better at pass rush if they draft one if they bring another in the the Marcus Davenport situation just wasn't a good situation for the Vikings that that crashed and burned. They tried to, you know, double back in what they did a year before. And it worked out with Zadarius, but not so much with Davenport. But they got to figure out a pass rush because, you know, you don't you don't want to have to rely on just blitzing all the time to get home to the quarterback. And so I think they need legitimate pat. I mean, and we we haven't talked about DJ Wanham either, you know, him coming back from injury what's going to happen with him so i think that's another situation for me with with pass rush that's important and last but not least and this is in no particular order they got to figure out what's going on with this running back position we've seen that the more effective teams the teams that go further in their seasons in the postseason they run the football all the memes, all the, the the jokes about Isaiah Pacheco and how he runs, but he is efficient for that Chiefs team. The, the Niners went out and traded for, well, they robbed the Panthers from <laughs> Christian McCaffrey, and they put a premium on being able to run the football. We saw so many times last season with this Vikings offense them not being able to establish the run and just getting pass happy because they couldn't run the football. If they can somehow figure that out, that's kind of been an inconsistent part of this offense since Kevin O'Connell has taken over. They got to figure out what they want to do with the running back to get a little bit more balance on this offense, especially considering what we don't know is going to happen at the quarterback position. A good running game will complement the quarterback, and they need to figure that out too. What do you think, Juju? Yeah, I think we all have a very similar points, especially when it comes to um, obviously they have to figure out the JJ situation. But when it comes to the quarterbacks, I think back to training camp last year and asking Byron Murphy about um, coming into this being the veteran at 25 years old, coming into this quarterback room and asking him about and it seems silly now the competition that comes with, you know, a new D coordinator and just so many new guys in one room all together, all kind of vying for these spots. And then we get to the season and especially there at the end and Byron Murphy's not playing. I, I you know, I, I'm happy to recant on things because I was thinking we don't see a lot from Byron Murphy, you know, when he's out there, we don't hear his name. We don't see him, you know, doing a whole lot. And then when he got hurt, that's when things really took a turn for the worse. And you realized how important he was to that cornerback position. You have a Caleb Evans getting benched and you're playing a practice squad player and Jawan Williams out there. And all of it's just bad, right? So could not agree more that, yeah, they need to look at free agents when it comes to cornerback. They need more experience in that room. I would also go on to say they have to figure out what they're doing with this 2022 draft class because we have not seen production from the most production that we have seen is a Caleb Evans. And that is disappointing to say the least. They have to figure out what they're doing with Andrew Booth. They have to figure out what they're doing with Lewis Seen and obviously a Caleb. I think a Caleb sticks around, but I do not see a future for Lewis Seen or Andrew Booth here, especially after Kwesi's answer and their closing pressers when he said, um, he was asked about him 
by Chuck Scoggins. And the answer was, yeah, we, we like how um, they've really adapted to our ideals here in the organization. And uh, we, we like how they've worked through the past two, you know, two years with us, this, that, and the other. It was very vague. It was very much a blanket answer mm-hmm. for we don't know what we're doing with these guys. Um, so I think at this point, they just got to figure out what they can get for those guys. Um, we'll see. Uh, it's kind of sad to see them kind of go out. I feel like very similar to the 2020 draft class where none of those guys are with this Vikings organization anymore. Um, so, yeah, I would say I, I have my list here, which says – We'll talk about TJ. Getting TJ healthy, I think, is a huge priority, which, you know, with the orthopedics that we have here in Minnesota, we've got that handled. Um, the JJ thing, but cornerbacks and just the secondary in general, especially when it comes to the 2022 draft class, got to figure out what to do with those guys. So for me, it's tough to look at stats because I like deep diving some of these stats and trying to like find a correlation to good versus bad. Here's the problem. Best rush defense in the NFL, Bears. They did not do well. Why? Offense couldn't produce. You look at the Lions, second best, really good. 49ers, third best. You got Patriots, fifth, uh, fourth best, not good. Buccaneers, fifth. Made it to the playoffs. Then you got the Houston Texans, Dolphins, Vikings did not make it to the playoffs as well as Jags. Then you go to the passing, it drops. The Vikings drop down towards the bottom. But you know who else is down there? The Lions. So at the end of the day, one of my priorities, I don't even know if they how they would do this, ball security. Like if the offense can work on ball security this entire offense, I don't know if Kevin O'Connell needs to give them footballs like the movie, the program back in the day and say, Take these home. If any one of your teammates brings me back your football, you are going to run until I say stop running. I don't know. I don't know how you punish grown men for fumbling, but you got to find a way to have some ball security. That's one, because when you look at all the stats offensively and defensively, this team should have been in the playoffs and should have had a better record than they had. Yes, I get it. Kirk Cousins Cousins got hurt. But even without that, some of those games Kirk was there for should have been wins earlier. And then Josh Jobs could have taken you down the way. Um, I, I just don't know. So my first priority, though, in this, looking at this whole thing, sacks. That's where I go to. The Vikings sack numbers were low. The Ravens were at 60. Uh, Chiefs uh, were right behind them at 57. So how do you create a pass rush like that to get deep in the playoffs? January sacks. You got to go find you an outside linebacker. Brian Flores is going to be the defensive coordinator. We know that now. He did not get a head coaching job. All the jobs are full. Uh, we know Reggie's dog threw up when Dan Quinn got the last job. Uh, But all the jobs are full. So Brian Flores is officially coming back. I think that's good. Good for Brian Flores. Good for the Minnesota Vikings. But what do they do there? You have to go get this man some tools in his toolbox. Kevin O'Connell has the tools. Now you got to get Brian Flores some tools. So my one priority tool, outside linebacker. Go get you a a true TJ Watt type of rush outside linebacker that can also drop and be comfortable dropping. Save money as well. I don't think signing Daniil Hunter is the answer when he's not a true outside linebacker and you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, even though that square peg found a way to get almost 16 sacks. You got to find a way to get a true guy there that can play your entire defense. Two, find you a cornerback, whether it's just playing man or being able to play two man, because we know he keeps three safeties in the game. And so that's going to be some type of shell where there's always some type of help coming from some different direction. But you got to find guys that can truly just cover when you need to send the house because that's the problem. Your guys are built for two man and they did great. But you got to find you a Deion Sanders, Joey Porter Jr. type of guy that's long, young, doesn't cost you a ton of money, but can just run with guys like people hate CJ Gardner Johnson. But you know what he can do? He can play man coverage. Uh, People hate him, like literally hate him. But he plays man coverage. He's annoying as hell but he plays man coverage, just like Darius Slay. You got to find you a guy. Those guys are all older, but you got to find you a guy. And my third one is sign Justin Jefferson. You got to sign Justin Jefferson. Like, you can't play this game. Like, the fact that my daughter got in the car and said, is Justin Jefferson not going to be a Viking? I'm like, where did you hear that from? So clearly, other people are talking about it. If it's down to the middle schools now are talking about it. So the Vikings have to sign Justin Jefferson. But my daughter did say this one, which kind of like literally, I've never thought more about something for my kid than that. And she was like, I just feel like Justin Jefferson's so good 
that eventually he's not going to be a Viking. I'm like, you're 12. Mm. Where did that even come from? But clearly, it's what happens when you grow up in Minnesota. She's it's already just born. Yeah, yeah, you're just born with it. And she's like, I just feel like he's so good that he's going to end up somewhere else. She's like, because any other team would take him right now and pay him. I'm like, what? I'm like, you're 12. But she, she knows clearly, ball. She clearly, like, she's a Justin Jefferson fan. She was super excited to meet him when we went to the Timberwolves game. Um, so he also signed a jersey for her. So she was, like, all giddy about that. But with all that said, she maybe she's on to something. Like, the fact that the Vikings are still pandering this and they're still playing this game, it just doesn't point to, like, successful long-term. It feels like eventually we're going to be in the Stefan Diggs, A.J. Brown. Uh, who else has done that? Devontae Adams. Uh, you name them. Situation where we're just watching Justin Jefferson end up with the Chiefs or something or the Patriots, and then he goes on and goes to a Super Bowl. So hopefully the Vikings get it figured out. Hopefully it's just maybe some verbiage uh, because I know that's big. The language in contracts is big. But speaking of language in contracts, we know when a guy like a tight end like TJ Hawkinson went this entire year, this entire offseason, before this year, Holding out with back injuries and all kinds of stuff. And now he ear truly infections, is... <laughs> bad ear infections, Ron. Back injuries, ear infections. <laughs> uh, didn't want to talk to the media, but now he's actually hurt. He did have surgery, so that's good. He is, he said he's doing well. So theoretically, an ACL sometimes could be more than six months. Everybody's saying six months, it could be longer than that. Uh, but I'll start with you, Julia. He's got the best doctors in the United States here in Minnesota. Um, so I would say six months, we'll see him back for sure. Uh, how important is this guy? He was important even when Kirk was still playing and healthy. And then he was even more important when all of the backups that we rolled through this past season came in and he was their number one target. He's, I mean, he is a backup quarterback stream. He's also, should should they bring in a rookie, he's a rookie quarterback stream too. Um Super healthy. And like you said, Ron, I mean, it all it's super important because they're paying him all this money. Like my dad always says, it's not about the money. It's about the money. Get back out there. I think that that's why I was saying in our first talking point that one of the top priorities for this team should be getting TJ back to where he needs to be. Um, he has proven himself. I mean, since he arrived, what, what week was that in the 2022 season? Mm-hmm. You know, people were tired of Irv Smith, <laughs> and then TJ came in, and it was like a, a breath of fresh air. Um, he makes a huge difference when he's not out there. And then after he he got hurt, his absence was felt in a big way. Um, so I, I think it's just a simple answer of you're paying him all this money, and also you see the difference that he makes. Granted, I, I hope once he is healthy, he doesn't drop as many passes coming into this next season. But I say um, with the with the care that he will have, not only through the organization, but just through TCO and the clinics that we have here in Minnesota, um, we'll see him back in six months. So I think is I think I caution everyone to not just assume like all right. You know, I, I hear what Julia said about us having some of the best doctors, but I think what's tough about that is everybody rehabs their knee injuries differently. If you, I, I look back at the end of the St. Louis Rams, they got Ty Gurley in the first round of that draft, and Todd had some some really really good years, but now Todd is out of the league. He was once considered probably the best running back in the NFL. If it was, it was probably a, a race of one between him and Zeke for the best running back in the league. And then the knee just deteriorated on him. He couldn't play more than like six, seven games, and then he couldn't play any games. And so, look, I'm not saying that about TJ, but I think – Everybody just has to be cautious and let him work his way back when he can get his get his legs underneath him. No pun intended. Um, I just think that that that's a tough injury, man. Like he had the MCL. He had to allow some time for the MCL to heal before having the ACL surgery, had the ACL surgery. And, you know, now you're probably looking at that three to nine. Month. So it was in January when it happened. Maybe around October, maybe we could see him back. Maybe. 
And so I think it's tough because, you know, there's a mental side of it as well. You know, the knee could be fine, but, you know, we talk about how the quarterbacks, you know, it takes them a while. Kyler Murray came back this year and he didn't look like the same guy. He was a little hesitant at times. People said, all right, give him some time. Maybe he'll he'll look better next season. And that's what the hope is there for him. And that's what the hope is for TJ. What I think is interesting is he already has a lot of things going on up top when the ball is coming his way. I don't know that a knee injury should have been added to those. Um, We saw so many drop passes from TJ. Most of those are on contested balls and, and things like that. He had 95 catches last year, 960 yards. But it's, I don't think it's unfair to say that he could have had more than 100 catches and more than 1,000 yards receiving if he had a, held on to some of those passes that he dropped. And so now you – I think that's my biggest concern is like, man, this offseason could have been big for him, you know, just kind of – getting with the jugs machine and, you know, kind of doing a little bit more as far as just trying to get his hand-eye coordination back and and better and getting in a lot of drills and situations. And now he's rehabbing his knee injury and he's not able to focus as much on some of those things. So I'm just wondering how that is going to go. But the Vikings are going to need him to be healthy and ready to go and at his best next season because he is critical to that offense. Yeah, he he is. And look at who's on the roster behind him. I don't know if Josh Oliver can carry you by himself while TJ is out, if TJ is out. I think it's a pup situation. Um, if you I'm I'm of the belief that the clock starts somewhat when the surgery occurs. Because they had to wait for five weeks, I think I assume the clock started like earlier this week. So that rehab is all going to be backed up. Maybe I'm wrong. Doctors get in my mentions, tell me I'm wrong. But I assume that this recovery is going to take a little longer because he waited until the end of January. He had to, to let the MCL heal. But let's say that it is the eight month mark that Adrian Peterson sort of set back in 2012 and technology and medicine's gotten even better in the last 12 years. But let's say it's eight months. That really aligns perfectly with what the pup is, which is four weeks Um, on the pup you don't play for the first four games then they activate you and you have a ramp up period that would seem to align very well with the typical recovery time and I think get him on the field after the first quarter of the season is gone if he can play in October that's great so it feels like a pup to me Uh, you're gonna have to have somebody else for those first four games in addition to Josh Oliver I'm eyeing up Gerald Everett maybe in free agency, someone who can sign a one-year deal and be a stopgap for you uh, while TJ is on the shelf. But I also look at his situation uh, you know, to, to our, our care people who cover the Twins really closely this past year. Remember Carlos Correa? He said, hey, I'm not in the contract year. I got paid, so I'm going to play through this plantar fasciitis. Like He was determined to play through that and get back on the field as soon as possible. Um, and, and maybe TJ views it the same way. Like, okay, I got paid now I'm going to do everything I can to be on the field. Uh, once this is, is, you know, once I kind of get out of that rehab, um, window. So I would expect to see him relatively soon this season, but week one is a tough goal. That would be impressive if they could get him out there for week one. I'm predicting a pup stint. Yeah. I I mean, I, I agree with that, Sam. I think pups come in. I think like Adrian Peterson was a freak of nature with his legs. And again, it goes to quads and calves and I'm not hating on TJ Hawkinson's legs. Um, I'm not familiar with his leg game. Uh, so I'm not going to even hate on that. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of that work. A lot of the leg lifts, a lot of the, like I had a knee injury and I remember it was nonstop leg lifts, nonstop trying to build my quad back up. And mine was just a simple MCL PCL, uh, not simple, but MCL PCL, but it was a ton of like quad stuff and quad and calf. Cause that's, that's the biggest part of your legs that can take a lot of the pressure off your knees um, and actually work harder. Um, but the other part of this, too, is injuries bring more injuries. Sometimes you overwork or you're, you, you know, you use another part of your body more because of the injury. And then that part gets overworked and ends up getting injured. Um, the biggest key is going to be, yeah, you're right. Josh Oliver can't carry him. So the question is, do they go out and try to sign 
a tight end knowing that TJ Hawkinson might not be back till October. Um, that a lot of that's gonna just you know depend. And the Vikings have a ton of decisions to make. They got Justin Jefferson, TJ Hawkins in the tight end situation, quarterback, uh, defensive line, outside linebacker, like cornerback. It's gonna be a busy offseason for Quasey, but that's why he makes all the money. But we have to talk about this all-star game. Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns, they made the all-star game. Some people think other players got snubbed. Some people think Anthony Edwards got snubbed, should have been one of the top all-stars, but the fans. I think the fans voting is too heavily weighted now. Um, take the popularity out of it. Go back to the old school version of it. I, I miss that where it was just vote the best players in. Fans, you can vote and let's just see it. Yay! 1%, maybe 10%. You're giving the fans too much power and it's putting guys in the all-star game that fans aren't even watching the game. People aren't watching Anthony Edwards play. If they did, they would be like, oh, my God, this dude is unstoppable. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the Nuggets, Suns, and Clippers. Are they just haters of the Timberwolves? Like, nobody wants to talk about the Timberwolves. Everybody wants to talk. I mean, people are talking about the Lakers beating the Celtics right now. Lakers beat the Celtics, and they're 25 and 25, and that's the story today. Not that the Timberwolves yeah, blew out the Mavs. <laughs> really, Reggie? <laughs> but before we do all that, we got a word from our sponsors. We're brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. The big game is coming up, and uh, of course, you got to get in the fun at FanDuel. I've been giving you the alliterative list. You got you got family, football, fun, food, FanDuel. Make it part of your your five Fs on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, because you got to have the best seat in the house. You got to have the game on TV. You got to have your bets up on FanDuel. And you can get 200 free dollars to wager with and play around with. If you haven't joined FanDuel yet, what are you waiting for? It's America's number one sports book. Uh, who's going to score the first touchdown? What color is the Gatorade going to be? Uh, how long is the first rush attempt of the game going to be? Like all of that is on the table for you. Hundreds of ways to wager at FanDuel, and uh, it's a blast. So check it out by putting out a $5 wager. If it wins, $5 or more. You get $200 in bonus bets. Again, for new customers, first bet of $5 or more. If it wins, $200 in bonus bets that you can lay down on the Super Bowl. FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Download the FanDuel Sportsbook app and make every moment more. Make the Super Bowl more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Well, now it's time to talk All-Star. We saw the uh, NFL All-Star game. That was very uh, – well, not the game, sorry. The the festivities so far. They had the uh, center snapping. Uh, they had dodgeball. They had the quarterback's, you know, accuracy thing. Uh, they need to get a competition committee to do better. But All-Star game coming up. Uh, they're going to have similar festivities. There's, uh, what, Sabrina versus Steph Curry now in a three-point competition. Uh, so that should be fun to see, you know, you know, who's going to come out on top. Are we going to have to hear about, you know, should they have a women's versus men's? I heard that three on three competition. There's all kinds of other stuff getting in, which this is the NBA all-star game, not the WMA, but I think they're trying to integrate it and find ways to get the WA involved in the NBA. Uh, but with that said, starters were named, reserves were named, Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Edwards are reserves. But what do you guys think about that? Was anybody else snubbed? Was Anthony Edwards stuff? Should Carl Anthony Towns be a starter? Let's we'll go start there. Let's go, Reggie. So um, I think it was a mild surprise to a lot of people when you know Ant got in. Everybody's like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah whatever, whatever. That that works. And then when Cat was announced yesterday, it was like, whoa. But you know what? Shout out to Cat because he. I think he was a little bit of a late bloomer this first half of the NBA season. You know, he was he was getting used to kind of being in the passenger seat as opposed to driving so much. You know, the the team itself is really good around him, so they're not requiring him to do so much. But also, Anthony Edwards is like the guy now. Like, he's the alpha of, of the team. And so, Cat, you know, he just – you know, chip in your points here, get some boards, you know, play some defense and, you know, just get in where you fit in. And then I, I would say maybe what, like over the last couple weeks or so, he's really turned it on, highlighted by that 62 point performance and a loss, you know, no less. But I think, you know, especially this last week, he's kind of been carrying the Wolves and, 
you know, I I know Ron thinks that, you know, Ant should have been an all-star starter. But you know what? I think Ant is a little bit of a throwback player. And I think, you know, if Ant was playing in the times where Michael Jordan was playing, I think, you know, he would no doubt be an all-star starter. But I think now in the age of guys scoring 30, 35 points a night, you know, Ant, sometimes he gets lost in some of these games. You know, he had all that that talk about, you know, the refs were cheating, got fined 40000 and then he came out against the lowly Mavs where you think maybe he should dominate, and he had nine points. And he has some of those games where he just – He'll have in the single digits or he'll he'll score in the teens and he's just not very involved. And when you look at guys who are scoring 30, 35 plus every night in this league, seems to be more about the scoring than anything. I, I just think it's tough to, to pick him over some of the guys who are having those outrageous scoring outputs. I mean, Tyrese Maxey scored 51 last night without Embiid. Like, these dudes are just scoring at an unbelievable clip right now. But I think shout-out to the the Wolves getting two All-Stars in. They are the best team in the West right now record-wise. And I think that – I think it would have been a a disservice to the Wolves to have that and not have multiple guys get in. That being said, I know a lot of people were talking about Rudy not getting in. You know, Rudy this year is averaging – 13, almost 13 and a half points and and 12, almost 12 and a half boards this season. Really looking like his all NBA defensive days. And so I know a lot of people thought that he would be the second guy. But like I said, the, in a league that's increasingly more about scoring, I think that just kind of won out. I think Rudy will probably be an injury replacement for somebody um, in the next few weeks. But I, I, I think that's that's pretty indicative of where the league is right now. And then, then you got Finch. They win this game tonight and Finch is coaching that, that all-star team. So that's a good representation of the wolves in their first half. I think Ant's still young, you know, we'll see him back. Not as a reserve. I'm sure. Um, The cat thing, I will say. I, and we talked about this yesterday in the sports office. I think Rudy got snubbed. Um, I would have picked Rudy over Cat. Rudy's averaging a double double right now. I think. I think he's playing some of the best ball of his life, and he's been pretty consistent this entire season. Cat, I think the draw with Cat is um, he pulls he pulls focus, he pulls attention. Right? People are going to watch Carl Anthony Towns in an All Star game. They're going to want to see him, uh, especially with how well he's playing right now. Right. Um, so people want to see that. Uh, I, I think Rudy's the the part that kind of sits him out of this one is the fact that he is a defensive player, and you know, like you said, it's becoming more and more about scoring, especially when it comes to an All Star game where it's all just about showing off the entire time, right? Um, it sucks for him. Uh, I think you know he's the front runner again for the defensive player of the year. Um, so I do agree. I also I also think this comes back to um, the Wolves themselves just being underrated all, all across the entire country. Um, so they're not going to give the Wolves three all-stars right off the bat, right? They're, they're just not going to do it because it's Minnesota and people always overlook the Minnesota sports teams, right? We see that all the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, Ant, we saw that one coming, but I'll be honest, I thought it was going to be Ant and Rudy yesterday, uh, before they announced, I just figured, oh yeah, it'll be Ant and Rudy. They've been the, the guys that we've talked about this, that, and the other, but, um, good for the Wolves just in general, having two all-stars. And you know what? At the top of the West, they should have two all-stars going there because that's how they get to be in the position that they're in right now. But I do, I feel for Rudy on this one. Um, I think he's, he's been a all-star four times already, I think. Um, I thought he deserved it over Cat for sure. Sam. Yeah. D- yeah. Did Cat rob his teammate of a spot? I, I think that Cat has put up a representative enough season where like, and, and he rebounds too, right? He gets other guys involved. The 50, 40, almost 90 shooting splits, like that's an insane shooting season for a big man. Uh, so I don't think it's undeserved. And I think it is so hard to compare some of these these resumes. Like 
you're putting, you know, the Kings are the ones who really got screwed here because De'Aaron Fox and DeMonte Sabonis both had cases to get in and they got shut out, um, which is disappointing for them. That's another small market that's yearning for respect. But how do you crack the starting lineup against Luca, who's like the biggest international star in the league right now, Shea, who is in a small market but is having a ridiculous season, and then Jokic, another international appeal guy who's like MVP caliber every year, LeBron and Durant. That is such a hard lineup to crack. There's like one flex spot. It's Shea. So Shea, Shea got the flex spot, and the other ones are basically locks because of just how popular they are, how consistent they are really hard to get in that group. Um, but good for the Wolves. Uh, I think that after the All-Star break, I feel like people will be forced to start talking about them once the Super Bowl is done. People really turn their eyes to basketball. The Wolves are going to start getting some more recognition, I think, starting with this All-Star game. The one, Yeah, the one thing I was going to say is Anthony Davis probably shouldn't even play. I mean, the dudes miss more games, like starting to miss a lot of games now with injury. He's out now with like an Achilles and something else. If he doesn't play, then that's the question is, would Rudy Gobert be the next one on that list? Uh, I think to Julia's point, I don't know if they would want three Timberwolves in this game. They should be, though, because, again, like you said, you're right. The number one team usually has a lot of all-stars or you know get gets a lot of all-star nods. Uh, when you look at the East – um, you could say that about the Celtics. You got Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum. Do they have another one? Not really. Um, you know, you look at the 76ers, they probably would have if they had James Harden still. They would have had Tyrese Maxey, James Harden, Joel Embiid. Um, so from there, like I could see, like I remember the days of like LeBron, D Wade, and Bosch. You know what I mean? Like when they when they were all at the top of the East and they all made the all-star game. So there is a way for Rudy Gobert to be on this. I think if Anthony Davis, I think respectfully. Anthony Davis should just bow out. One, you've been hurt anyway. Is this going to matter for you to get out there and run around and probably get, you know, you're not going to get hurt because guys aren't playing hard. But knowing Anthony Davis, he'll fall on his own foot somehow and uh, twist his ankle. And then LeBron's over there like, all right, here we go again. Uh, that's why people are saying they should trade Anthony Davis. I know a lot of people saying if, if I was Jenny Buss, I know Snoop Dogg said it. Trade Anthony Davis, Jenny Buss, and move on. Uh, but do I think that I think Anthony Davis should be a starter? I would have put him over. I know everybody loves Shea, Gilgis Alexander. I would have put Anthony, um, uh, or not Anthony. Um, what's the guy's name? Anthony Edwards. It is Anthony. <laughs> so many Anthony's. Anthony Edwards. I would have put him over Shea uh, Alexander, Gil Gilgis Alexander. But that's just me. That's just me. Uh, but yeah, Luka Doncic. You can't you can't deny his stardom. Kevin Durant is a beast. Uh, Jokic. Same thing. LeBron is LeBron. I think the only difference is I would have I would have replaced Anthony Edwards with Shea, but I get it. Shea is becoming a national star. Uh, he bought the red boots out I think a year ago, and everybody jumped on those. They look stupid, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, we have our All Star team: Rudy Gobert with all the blocks, the rebounds. Yeah, I think he was snubbed, but when you look at the list of stars, quote unquote, in the West, it's kind of tough to put him over Steph Curry, Paul George, Kawhi. Um, I wouldn't even put him over Carlin D. Towns. I think Carlin D. Towns has proven he can be a star. So um, I, I, I get it. But if Anthony Davis is hurt, I think Rudy Gobert should be the name in there. Time to move on. Uh, when you think about this season, just quickly, the Nuggets, Suns, Clippers all have better odds to win the championship over the Timberwolves. Is the star power part of it? I'll start with you, Sam. Yeah, I, I think that I forget sometimes and we forget that Yes, like Vegas and the sports books, like they they create the starting point for these odds, but then the market dictates it. The betters are the ones who control the line. So True. people see Jokic championship winner, Kawhi championship winner, Durant championship winner. There, there there's established credible NBA Finals guys in the West right now, and the Wolves just aren't that. So the Wolves aren't getting that kind of respect. I, I understand it, and um, you know when I go to to Iowa next time, and I can put a future bet on the Wolves, I will appreciate having that little bump. So thank you. Don't bet on the Wolves. Keep the value high for us uh, who want to cash in on the Minnesota Timberwolves. Julia. Yep, couldn't agree more. I think uh, Nuggets defending champs, they're always going to have that 
that pick when you're going into the next year, especially with such a similar team. Uh, Clippers, you got Paul George, Kawhi. You got James Harden acclimating better than people expected him to. Um, for the Suns, KD and Devin Booker and, and then Beal coming in too are already up their odds uh, there. I think also with the Timberwolves, the problem is um, it's basically the same team as last year and they choked. Uh, they're playing great in the regular season for sure, but – People don't want to bet on them because they don't know what's going to happen in the postseason because they haven't seen it before. Um, the goal going into the season for the Wolves was just to win a playoff series. And now people are thinking, well, could they go deeper than that? Um, I think it, it just comes down to the fact that people don't believe in the Wolves because they haven't seen it for themselves before. So exactly what you said, Sam. What do you think, Reg? Yeah, I think uh, the, the Wolves kind of have to just like, prove it first i think a lot of people are not taking them seriously just because of what we've seen in the last two playoff series that they played um the memphis one regrettable i think that that team had a lot of talent and they just messed it up against the grizzlies so um i think people have ptsd from that and they're like yeah they're good but you know and and i think you know with the the clippers surging and the star power that they have and you know they got a championship head coach they got a championship uh star player who's playing a lot more than he's played in recent years and paul george is a, a is an all-star great wing man uh to Kawhi. and now you got harden playing a little bit motivated um and then you look at the suns you know kd's the championship player Listen, I know people try to discount my my bubble Lakers, but Frank Vogel is a championship head coach. They'll figure it out. So I and, and then the Nuggets, you just they're the champs. Like everything has to go through them. So I think that's probably a big reason why you know the Wolves are not necessarily favored. But if they just keep this up and just keep proving people wrong, they'll be where they need to be. I'm gonna go with star power. I, I think I, I agree with Sam on the the champions. But I also think it's star power, and that's why the betters, Sam's right on that. The betters decide. So if I'm going to Vegas and I'm like, oh, the past winners, Nuggets, or these Timberwolves that I don't know what's going to happen, they might be the Detroit Lions, I'm betting on the Nuggets. If I say the Suns, Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, who ballers. Kevin Durant, one. Uh, what are these Timberwolves going to do? I don't know. Give me the Suns. Same with the Clippers. You got three monsters there, and James Harden have, hasn't even really hit his stride yet. And so you think about Kawhi can take over a game. You got Paul George can take over a game. And then you got Harden. When you double any of those guys, Harden's going to cook. So you got to play man. Like you you basically are – there's no way around those three guys unless they're off. And so I get the betters, but it's definitely star power. But Anthony Edwards is going to show the world he's a star this year. So I'm looking forward to that. But everybody, want a star? Go to SiriusXM. There's a ton of stars on there. You can star rate us. That's Locked On Sports Minnesota on SiriusXM. Just download the SiriusXM app on any app market platform that you have. Just search SXM in the search bar. Download the app right there and then search Locked On Sports Minnesota. We'll be right there with you all the time. But SiriusXM has all the sports, Vikings, Wild Wolves, anything you want on SiriusXM. Make sure you check it out and you can take it on the go. Well, lastly, we got to talk about the Twins. They traded Jorge Polanco for two pitchers and two prospects. Julia, what do you think about that one? Yeah, I would give this trade a B plus because I think that's the best that the Twins could do right now, um, given the circumstances. I think people, I think a lot of Twins fans were looking forward to a trade like last year where you send a big hitter for a big pitcher without Sonny Gray coming back. Um, but at the moment, I just don't think that's in the cards for the Twins. I think uh, they got what they could out of this one. Um, Jorge Polanco, he's losing his spot with the Twins anyways when you have guys like Eddie Julian there and you've got Brooks Lee coming up um, that both hit well infielders that are doing, you know, fairly consistent out there. Um, I'd also say, you know, you get with Disclafani, you get a bottom, a bottom of the rotation starter in there, which they needed uh, for sure. And you get also an outfielder as well. I mean, you get a, re a reliever that helps your bullpen for sure, helps you get back to having one of, if not the best bullpen in the league. Um, but then you also get the Mariners, what top one of their top five prospects as an outfielder, which is certainly promising for the Twins. They've shown that they uh, know how to develop these prospects and, and get their use out of them. But I think without the TV money, 
like the unknown of that whole situation right now. Um, they did what they could with this trade. And, and so I give it a B plus. I give it a B only because Jorge Polanco is such a mainstay here in Minnesota. People love him and they, they hate to see him go. I think Max Kepler is probably pretty upset to see one of his best friends go. Um, but uh, I think they got what they could out of a 31 year old that they didn't see a whole lot of production out of last year. Yeah, I I like the trade for the Twins simply because uh, you get multiple cracks at it with all like I me. Mean, you you might hit on Topa, you might hit on Desclafani. You've got a prospect in Gonzalez. You can hit home runs. Like you you've widened the the net. Like you've got a few things that can go right here, and I like that. I think with Polanco, the last two seasons he's missed almost half the games. He hit 244. He might be a depreciating asset at age 30. Um, so I'm actually, I'm fond of the deal. I think that De Sclafani, like he's had some really good seasons. You don't really know what you're going to get. And Topo was high end last year. So you help yourself now and you help yourself later with Gonzalez, who's a power hitting outfielder. So I like this deal for the twins. I would give it an A minus. Ooh, I like it, Sam. I, I think I'll give it a B plus too with Juju just because like, you know, I, I covered uh, Disclafani in Cincinnati. Disco, Disco coming to uh, to Minnesota. And so he's a good pitcher. But if you look at his stats, he went four and eight with the Giants last year, got traded twice in, in like a two-month span um, this offseason. And I think the main thing with Disco has been his health. And if he can, you know, he he ended up missing the the latter part of last season as well with an elbow injury. And so talent has not been the thing with him. It's his availability. And I don't know what it is with the twins getting these guys who are are injury questioned. But you know, you just hope for the best. Like you said, Julia, he's gonna be a back of the the back end of the rotation guy. So you know, maybe he's not a guy that you count on so much, but, you know, you lose some pieces. Julia's favorite, Emilio Pagan, is not there anymore. And so, you know, you get Topa uh, at, in the in the bullpen, which, which can help. The Twins, all we heard is they're slashing payroll, slashing payroll. So they're doing little things to try to, you know, make sure that they're going to stay competitive in this division that still might be pretty weak. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and and for me, I just I'm glad they got some pitchers because that's all I hear about on social media is who's going to pitch. They need a deeper bullpen. So if you can add pitching, you do lose. Um, I mean, you got to find a way. There's no magic formula to winning a pennant. So maybe this is it. Who knows? Maybe the Twins are just I don't know. They're just always going to like be what they are uh, until they're willing to spend more money. But until next week. That'll do it for us today. I'm Ron Johnson. That's Sam Ekstrom. That's Julia Dams. That's Reggie Wilson, both from Care 11, Sam and I. You know, we're just two guys that show up and come to work every day. Uh, but I'm Ron Johnson. Make sure you guys download Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel 24-7. Sports around the clock. That's Wild Wolves, Vikings, Gophers, Lynx. Uh, we're probably going to talk Minnesota myth because I know Arif Hassan and Luke Braun love some arena football. So we will have it all here on Locked On Sports Minnesota. Thank you guys for joining. Thank, thank you, everydayers, for, for downloading and listening to us. And have a great weekend.